First of all, I want to say I thank you so much for this opportunity. It's an honor to uh, be um, doing this with you today. I consider you one of the top people I've ever met as far as activists, <clears throat> your intelligence. But more than that, there's it's a deep, it's a deep um, abiding love of what you're doing for the right reason. And not too many of us can do that. And that really keeps us connected. And Eric, as far as you see, like, I know you're totally against politics, you're against Trump, and I and I don't argue with that one bit. But as far as what Trump did do is, I remember when he was first polling 30% in a um, Republican primary, and that's basically the threshold that's going to get you elected. Mm. He started that, the media ruthlessly attacked him, and I will never forget it. He, he countered back with fake media, fake media. He said that three times a day throughout his tenure as president, and it caught on. It, it Tens of millions of people seen it just because of that and understand this is a fake media. Mm -hmm. I tell people till I'm blue in the face this for 20, 30 years, and they're you're not making a dent. This guy mm -hmm. says, now, he did so much for that mm -hmm. that people nowadays do not take television verbatim like they used to. No. Yeah. And I remember 9-11 like it was yesterday. And 9-11 and, um, happens. My mom calls me. We were going golfing. And she says something about the towers. I turned it on. And then it's like an hour later, all of a sudden, she's like, it's Bin Laden. She didn't even know who <laughs> Bin Laden was. All, all that was was what the boob tube was saying. Uh, right. It's Bin Laden. Yeah. And then, uh, and then upon the weeks afterwards, you start doing... And I was already a, quote, conspiracy theorist, which is nothing more than somebody who figures out people are conspiring. But I was already a conspiracy theorist and already knew, that, you know, something was up here with our policies in the Middle East. And then there was no Israeli deaths in the tower. So this, you're doing this, the World Trade Center. How could that happen? And then you're, uh, OK, well, there was no Israeli deaths in the tower. How could that be? And the World Trade Center, 28, there should have statistically been 500 to 1,000. Of Israelis at random. So right. obviously, and there was the Israeli shipping company that was in there that uh, moved out like a week before, and then yeah. it was owned, owned by all. Mr. Silverstein. Yeah. So there is a lot of uh, <laughs> interesting connections there, as well yeah. as the the dancing Israelis right afterwards. Uh, uh -huh. They were there apparently to uh, to film it. They said on Israeli TV to film the event, and and they were quite happy that it transpired as as they knew it would. <laughs> and the Chicago Commodities Market Exchange traded off their airplane stocks and insurance stocks when the markets opened at five o'clock in the morning at unprecedented rates. Mm -hmm. So already when you're adding this up in the subsequent after the event and then you go into, well, we needed political leverage to get into Iraq to start a war over there, which are nothing more than pro-Israeli. Um, but it's worse than that because it's murder and there's five, we lost 5,000 Americans and I, I think it's the total is a million, um, uh, Iraqis. And I, and, and I just wanted to say this on that topic too. Okay. The, um, the U S government is, as we know, we're constantly trying to, and I don't know how you feel about the second amendment, but they're constantly trying to take guns from people. You're right to protect yourself and your family. And... <clears throat> But the ones who are trying to take these guns are that same government that went into Iraq on a lie. They knew it was a lie. They knew he didn't have weapons of mass destruction. They didn't even de and and they didn't even describe them. I remember Dennis Kucinich saying, "What are these weapons of mass destruction?" He goes, "Let's be, be more specific and stop calling them WMDs. What are you talking about?" Well, they went in there because they were in this post 9/11 trauma. They got the psychological leverage they needed to start a war over there. So they start a war on a lie. They murder millions of people. And then um, how many more in Afghanistan and elsewhere? And even these uh, Ukraine. And we can go back and talk about all the wars in the 20th century, too. The government that does this, that lies, creates psyops and kills hundreds of thousands and millions of people. Are going to take your gun because three people were shot over here. But but mm. they're going to th this government that's a murderous, treacherous, lying, and counterfeited 
trillions of dollars to do it too. So they stole money to do the, to commit this murder, and then they they're going to regulate who can have a gun and who can't. That right, right. <laughs> they're going to be the ones that decide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's exactly. how ridiculous. Yeah. And another thing, I I, um, I like what you said too about um, okay, every news story just about begins with a precondition that we are slaves. Okay, it's always about it's the president of Ukraine or or Putin or Trump or or one of these leaders or the house of something or some bureaucracy is always hitting the headlines like this. You have to be told by this person what to do. Like this person's an authoritarian. Are they going to give you permission to do this? Are they going to give you permission to do that? We, we don't need permission from any of those people to do any of that. And not only is it constitutionally invalid, it's by God's law. You don't tell another person what to do, how to live their lives. <clears throat> and another thing you taught me about the slave uh, system is that all mandatory taxing is slavery. That's, that video you did on that a few weeks back was absolutely spot on. I had so many people like that. And just spread that one around. But the slavery, forced taxation is slavery because it's taking the product of your labor. You don't even know what that money goes. But all taxes should have opt-out clauses, all of them. If you don't want the, what you're buying, you don't have to buy it. Or it's a slave system, period. And all governments are part of it. And the fact of, uh, before we get into Flat Earth, which I do want to discuss in detail, the fact that there's an Antarctica treaty just tells you that all of these are in cahoots together. Every single government in the world is they're controlling this together. And they go through a cold war for 50 years. But in the meantime, they're happy to protect everybody else from going to Antarctica, which right. according to these ball earth, uh, whatever you want to call them, these ball spinning believers, um, Antarctica is just a wasteland of nothing. So why would you even want to protect it? Just like uh, what happened in 2020, suddenly the whole world is in lockstep unison, including Russia and everywhere else. And Oh, we all agree we all have to lock down because of whatever. And then when everything opens back up, OK, we're enemies again. Let, let's continue, <laughs> continue uh, pretending like, uh, like we're at, at opposition here. Even though whenever it really matters, we're all in lockstep. <laughs> yeah, the COVID stuff, though, by the time the COVID stuff came around, it was a joke from the onset. I honestly, Eric, the, the day I seen it, me and my buddy were talking and I was like, they got to be, they cannot be that stupid to believe this stuff. I go, first of all, they played every card they can to get rid of Trump. Now they're going to play a last one. Or I guess they're going to just try to get rid of him. And they're going to start with this stuff. And then all of the statistics for the flu just went away. And people are like, oh, well, I watched on TV. It's because some people wear masks and um, stay six feet or whatever it is. And it it's so ridiculous. It, it, honest to God, that, that story is, it, it still boggles my mind, Eric. My mom is a churchgoer, and I don't oppose Christian principles. And I think they're great. But I'm not a true uh, fan of organized religion and i told her that but um she she wanted me to go to a uh, mass with her and i go in there eric i said mom i'm not wearing a mask so i walk in there's, there's 300 people with masks on i go mom this is like a zombie apocalypse <laughs> people are being controlled by the boob tube i go they're telling them to go wear these masks so they won't kill each other and they believe it mm -hmm. i go how it's it's absolutely ridiculous and i'll say another thing eric about about aids i don't know how much you've I've seen some of your stuff, but anyways, they said the same thing about AIDS back in the 1980s, early 90s, how this was going to run through the heterosexual population. And at the time, I, I wasn't super promiscuous, but I had girlfriends and it was like, you're always a little worried. And then after I, I read this thing about Peter Duisburg saying that this, you know, this stuff is all kind of like, no, it's not what you're, they're telling you. And that, uh, when they get the HIV, it's the treatments that are causing all the body problems. And then they say it's complications of HIV. It's not. It's complications of doing all these drugs mm -hmm. for the HIV, which really meant nothing to begin with. 
Right. Here we are 30 years later, Eric. I don't know one person who died from AIDS, one heterosexual person. And they were making us look like this was going to be millions of people were going to drop dead. Mm -hmm. And that's the way they do it. And they, they, they run their they run their BS through television. People buy it. And they, and they do it with uh, cancer and diabetes and, and all the other things, too, is they, they scare you with the diagnosis to then treat you with the thing that's really going to hurt you. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> these radiation and chemotherapies and all these things. If you were to just get the diagnosis and then understand that these are chronic degenerative illnesses that you can reverse through lifestyle and diet changes, which is the same way you brought them on, uh, then it would be fine, but that's not what they do. They give you this diagnosis and then oftentimes they'll even give you a window of how long you have to live unless you do their treatments, which are statistically some of the worst ones, the most expensive ones that they have to do because that's what they're, you know, given they have all these expensive machines and everything. And so then they charge you to use them. But, uh, you know, the, the free, the best advice they could give you would probably be to stop eating for a while. And when you start again, just have fruit, <laughs> but that nobody could make any money on that, but it cures, you know, most all chronic and degenerative illnesses. So there's a, a whole racket based on this kind of thing. Um, the whole allopathic system is basically set up that way. And AIDS was just one of the things along the line. And COVID is just another thing along the line. And there'll be another one coming up soon, I'm sure, that they'll scare everyone with. And it will be a nothing burger except for whatever they tell you the cure is it'll probably come in this form and then everybody will have to line up to get that and be convinced that they're cured of whatever it was that wasn't even a big deal in the first place right right <laughs> right yeah. yeah that's for sure right. um, same with the like you're saying about in iraq or whatever that they create the problem mm -hmm. make you panic about something that actually isn't an issue at all then they go in and they do real damage, actual, you know, deaths, like you said, a million Iraqis. And then uh, afterwards, you find out that the whole reason that you were scared and this whole thing happened in the first place was nothing. They, they, they lied about it. Yeah, and yeah so they lied about it. This yeah, is the M.O., it, whether it's politics, the medical field, the scams abound everywhere. Like you said, in flat earth, even when you go to NASA and you go to this whole outer space thing, a lot of people don't realize that whole thing's a big scam as well. Uh, we're just inundated with falsehoods through the boob tube and people take it as gospel truth and it, it's too much. I mean, that's why you get labeled a conspiracy theorist the second you step outside because once you really start going out there you find that this is a lie and this is a lie and that's a lie and that's a lie. and then suddenly you're on the whole opposite playing field from these other people who take the yeah. boob tube as gospel truth yeah. and now you are two different people that can't talk anymore yeah. you you fell by the wayside you you listen to that internet now or whatever it is the other generation and they're just still yeah. looking at the news believing 100 percent every single thing that happens and and it's brilliant that way if uh, only 10% of the lies were, were that way, it may be we, we'd be able to still connect with each other. But the fact that they flip everything 180 degrees on its head, like the Masonic checkerboard, black and white, uh, it's like their MO is whatever 100% whatever the opposite direction is, let's pretend that's what reality is. And that's what they do. And by doing that, you split uh, humanity into two. The knowers and the believers, you know, the the duped and the undupable. Right, <laughs> right. And once you reach the point of being undupable, it's funny, too, because I was still duped. Like back in the 90s, like I said, that's when I started growing my understanding that governments, media and the banks work together. And they're all, you know, they're all controlled by a very tiny percentage of people and they're psychopaths. And you can never satisfy them. And, you, and uh, anyways, that's once I realized that, OK, I had a friend of mine used to say how the moon landings was a bunch of nonsense, but I never really paid attention because I was more I had an affinity for these for these um, these so other sociological topics. Like I said, with the World War Two propaganda, with um, uh, the divide and conquer with the race issues going on and all of that. And, and um 
that was my uh, you, 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 that's that's where I was at as far as understanding what's going on. Like I said, my thing was the, the but I said it's the banks, it's the media, and their control of the government through that. The uh, politicians are really middle managers. They're not they're not authority. They, they don't have the authority. They take their marching orders from the money above them. No question about it. But uh, then, uh, say about two, 20, I had rotator cuff surgery in 2015, and I, and I hadn't had television there again about 12 years. Mm. But I got the television because it's, if you ever had that, it's, it's, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But you just sit oh, there and the you got television, up, the television yeah, or the rotator cuff that, surgery. Well, that's for sure. Both. But then, at least I could take the television with a grain of salt at that point. No, I wouldn't <laughs> wish television on anyone. But I was, I got it to watch some sports because I'm just sitting there. I can't yeah. even, my doctor, so at the time, the surgeon said, don't even, don't even want you walking because if you fall and you go to catch yourself, you're going to tear that. So anyways, long story short, I got television again. And I was watching this special. It said some millions of people. This was 2015. Don't believe it. The earth is, uh, they think the earth is flat in Brazil. And I'm like, Brazil? So I, that's what I started. Did And then I seen your thing. 200 proofs by Eric Dubé and just like, boom, 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 boom. And that just like, wow. And then I remember debating a friend of mine and I said, to, and I, and I used exactly what you said, why would they lie? And he, and his answer was, dude, the earth is flat. So I'm mm -hmm. looking at it. That was all he said. And I was like, <laughs> but I, I had enough trust and his respect for this guy. I'm like, hey, we gotta be a little bit onto something. And then, like I said, I as soon as I got my nose in that book, yeah, th there's no way it's not flat, and there's no way it's moving, and it's you understand why is the why is easy to understand once you see what's going on. They want to control your senses. They don't want your senses controlling you. They want to be your senses. I said this, you know, the boob tube says this. Don't look at that. Like, um, and and once they can get you to forget about what I see, forget about what I hear, forget about what I smell. It's the, it's the television. That's going to be my senses. That's what I'm going to listen to. And the educational system government, that's why they, that's behind everything there. And <clears throat> without a doubt. And, and then they, um, like you were saying in that last one, you, it's, you, you break it down really simple. You don't have to get, um, super complicated, and that's why people like Neil and them get all of these long equations that they know nobody understands, and they don't probably even understand them. Right. And and spherical trigonometry, Eric, I've taught college at the, uh, I've tutored college math and statistics, and spherical trigonometry is not that difficult to figure out. And if you look at the globe and you quarter it, and you 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 use that Pythagorean theorem, you can figure out the curvature without using your calculation but that eight inches per square mile is very accurate so it's easier to just use that mm -hmm. if somebody ever needed an explanation i could sit them down within depending on their level of of aptitude i could teach them in in a short time how to do this and it's not that difficult to understand and the lake michigan one is perfect because it's 60 miles would be buried by 2400 foot of curvature not only would you not be able to see the tops, you can see the bottoms of these buildings because that just tells you that that lake is flat. Right. And um, and like you said, if nobody ever came up with this super sophisticated stuff that they teach you, no one would have even believed it in the first place because it's not. It doesn't feel like we're spinning. I, I can't even imagine all them different motions we're supposed to be doing. It's uh, we're. <laughs> Well, if we're spinning 1,037 miles an hour, going 67,000 miles an hour around the sun, going through the universe at, what is it, a half a million? And then millions more moving. And at the same time, you can see the North Star in the exact same spot every day. Like, wait a minute, am I missing It's something? like a seasonal wobble, too, supposedly, within all that, too. Yet the North Star is just there and all the other constellations stay fixed in their relative positions for thousands of years ever since they've been named and, and traced makes absolutely no sense that we could possibly be going through all those motions see none of it feel none of it um but you you talk about all these other lies that we've already discussed and people saying why would they lie 
and the earth. Why lie about the shape of the earth? It just seems irrelevant. But imagine if you are a real forward thinking psychopath and you want to create a new world view for your subjects. Where do you start? What's the first big lie that you have to tell everyone so that you can totally control their worldview and become their authority, their authority figure, because you know things that they don't know that they can't access about reality um, that you've figured out and it's been established um, and they just have to trust you now. Well, obviously cosmology, the earth and everything beyond us, you know, in the sky above and below. So if you're going to fashion a worldview for your subjects beneath you, and the whole point is to lie to them so that you can gain control over them, the first, the biggest, the most fundamental foundational lie you need to tell is this one. People have just been under the spell for so long that they can't even see why would you lie about this thing, the shape of the earth that seems so irrelevant. It's not, it's incredibly relevant. If you're right. going to, so imagine if you um, took somebody captive since childhood, put them in a box, and all they knew was whatever you told them um, from their box. They'd never get outside, know anything about the outside world. You get to feed them all information about what's outside the box. Well, that's literally what is happening to us, like you said, with the Antarctic Treaty, with NASA telling us what is uh, out in outer space above us. Oh, it's millions and billions and trillions of miles. Oh, OK. And so then we get in our imaginations like they are making us do rather than be physical explorers like we can and should do. And then we'd actually find answers. But we don't have that kind of thinking because we've been given these pseudo answers and placated and thinking we know things that we don't know. And so that is what the controllers have doing and why they're doing it is because this fundamentally makes you think you know things that you don't know. So then you grow this ego inside of yeah. you and you start defending the people that lied to you because they are the purveyors and explorers who found out all this knowledge that you just believe because you haven't actually figured it out for yourself. And when a flat earther comes around and is skeptical, you just think, how could you possibly be skeptical yeah. about yeah. something that has been like, so established? And you only think it's been established because so many people have believed it for so long. And there are many pseudo explanations that are offered over and over again that people have believed for so long. If you delve into it deeper than that, that's when you get to the meat of it. But most people are satisfied by that surface level stuff. And so you can't really break through to it. And they'll just give you questions like, but why would they lie about the shape of the earth as a defense mechanism more so than an actual question? They don't really want to know the answer. They're asking you the question because they think it's a way to shut you up because it's such a ridiculous, whatever you yeah. say, however you answer that, it's it's going to be ridiculous to them oh, to control us for money. <laughs> uh, whatever you say, you know, they'll scoff at it. And of course, the question is kind of like a setup, too, because how could you know why someone else is lying? You're not the liar. Ask them. Why would you, why would you right. ask me? So the whole question, uh, in essence, you're asking the wrong person anyway, and so you can't answer it to their satisfaction. It's kind of a trap. <clears throat> yeah, and like you said, too, when you break it down in the common sense, you don't overthink it. It's easy to figure this stuff out. Like, I've seen this cartoon, and I, I would love to put it, because I, I do moderate one of the sites on Facebook. Um, and anyways, I would put some of the stuff on there, but when they use a lot of expletives, I'm not going to do it just because it gives you the wrong, it's the wrong, you know, publicity. You don't really probably don't want it, but this guy's going, he's kind of vulgar, but anyways, he's showing this spinning ball over here. Right. And then over here, he's showing this flat like line with a guy walking and this isn't moving over here. And he's like, um, they keep asking me, well, if the earth is flat, why don't you fall over the edge? And he's like, look, he goes, this is a line here. I'm walking on a line that's not moving. This ball's spinning. Which one does it look like you're going to fall off? Of? He goes, yeah, this ball is spinning a thousand miles. I think there's a better chance you'll fall off of this exactly. than you'll fall off of that. And, 
and I swear to God, um, this is, it's just, it makes you just cry. But he, he's so vulgar in the thing, like I said, I don't want to post it. But that, that's about where we're at. It's, you know, the, this stuff isn't really all rocket science, if that's the right word I want to use. <laughs> There's another one, right? <laughs> they make it sound like, or astrophysics. It's got this yeah. highfalutin, I, you know, oh, it's, it's not like it's astrophysics. Why is that so difficult to um, to imagine things that you've never even physically or empirically verified? Yeah, that's a real difficult field of study to just yeah. assume things that you can't possibly experiment on about distant stars and, you know. <laughs> that is the astrophysics. Yeah, yeah, rocket science. Yeah, Ro what is rocket science? It, I know, it might I just don't be know. Uh, helium balloons that look like rockets for all we know. <laughs> But yeah, the flat Earth stuff, it's its just, like I said, once I started looking at that, the curvature, the plane, that plane, the Blackbird that goes 2,190 miles an hour would have to be dipping at something like seven miles every minute. Right. And it's a fly and stay at the same altitude. I mean, the, these calculations aren't coming from left field either. They're easy to figure out if you just do a little math here. 2,100 miles is cooking yeah. in an hour. That's east coast to west coast, basically. And of course, if it's on its, you know, it's going to have to fly like this, and like you're on a Ferris wheel, kind of, not on a flat level horizontal plane. Right. And um, but some and some of the other ones, the water though, that's that's another one. Water doesn't bend at its surface. It's, it, it, that's another thing. It's all used. It's a universal level. Um. But yeah, oh, and I wanted to get into uh, also about the nukes. Mm -hmm. I know you did a thing on that. And I, by the way, I go to your site a lot. I use a lot of those stuff on there. I go in there and navigate that site and come up with some stuff that's just awesome. A lot of it I already know, but a lot of it I come up with, like the, the like you said, with the nukes. Now, if you notice, too, throughout this 20th century, they started a war and then they started a um like uh, if you ever watch a series of soap operas, they always end with another little thing that you're looking forward to seeing the next one. And <clears throat> well, that ended World War II was over. And then all of a sudden, I think it was a week or two later, then they reported that that was a, a, a nuclear bomb that bomb dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In the meantime, the Manhattan Project costed $50 billion back in 1945. <laughs> And so there, uh, so then they started it. Well, it was a nuke. They wanted to start another soap opera to end that war to start the Cold War. Now they got a nuke. Mm -hmm. okay. Now Russia well, was a couple of years later. Russia's got atomic bombs, and then well, we got to get a hydrogen bomb, which is ten times more powerful than that, or whatever, thousands of times. Then they got to get them. Then we had to get subs, and then we had to get long-range bombers, and then they got them. And then the space race through the '60s. So all this money that's being spent on nothing is 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 um you know calculated for this stuff that's going it's just basically printing money and throwing it in the garbage and um but it the 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 nukes was used as a as a propaganda tool to start the cult to kick start the cold war build all this stuff up and then the fear the constant fear mongering i still got pictures of people hiding under desks mm -hmm. like I, like, come on, if, if there's going to drop a bomb and there's nothing going to grow for 14,000 years, what would even be the sense in hiding under the desk? Right. You know, it's <laughs> the whole purpose is right in here. It's the psychological effect it has on the children to have them go through these drills where they're hiding under their desks and imagining these scenarios of, you know, nuclear explosions happening. Armageddon. Yeah, Armageddon, all that. So it's it's has nothing to do with actually physically protecting you as they always it's their excuse what it is is psychologically damaging you is what they're really trying to do but they do it under the guise of physical protection we're here to save you we're here to protect you this is gonna save you right now this is gonna physically damage you, you know? right exactly but one thing i also wanted to ask you eric almost forgot okay um you're you're you started the Flat Earth rejuvenate. It's obviously it's been flat since the dawn of time, so mm -hmm. technically you didn't start it, but you you spiked the revolution of, um, among people with your releases in 19, in 2014. Um, 
Now, I think they knew probably when the internet came on in the 1990s, eventually people would, the re, the ones who know, they know eventually people would figure a lot of this stuff out eventually. And But I don't think they thought it was going to happen as quick as it did. And you hit them with a blitz in 2014 to the point of where it grew exponentially and they could no longer control it. So now they start to damage control as best they can. But I think that put up their agenda and it threw a monkey wrench into what they were trying to do because I believe they were going to try to plan this Corona thing just back a few more years than they did. They pushed it up because they know people are starting to uh, understand and revolt, psychologically revolt when I say that. Um, but they against, literally said we need to flatten the curve at the beginning of their COVID yeah, thing, right. which is yeah. our word. We have a, a literal flat earth documentary by that name. And now suddenly the mainstream media is parroting that term over and over again. Uh, yeah, it did seem pretty uh, synchronistic that uh, that would happen that way. And I wonder if it had to do with them trying to quell all of this dissent from the flat earth and other awakening movements that were happening because it did work for some time at first though i think in the end it bit them in the butt because now so oh, many yeah. more people have woken up because they pushed all that propaganda so hard for the past three years so and i do know a lot of people who even went along with the jabs and everything who said never again they yeah. figured it out and I so know. though yeah. i do know people like you said who took five of them still got covid and still believe in it even though people like me are their friend who had zero jabs and zero covids and mm -hmm. but they still somehow think that <laughs> they're you know what the mainstream media told them and what they decided to do uh was the the right thing to do okay yeah the right thing to do that's another <laughs> thing they try they attack you with guilt fear shame at 24 7 with uh the media that's all it that's like I said, I wouldn't wish television on anyone. That's all it is. It's a bunch of that. And they want, and like I said, with the divide and conquer, with they're constantly barking at the race issue. They they like everywhere you go, Eric, I, I'm sure you too, but everywhere you go, people basically get along. You know, if you go into a work environment, you're working with people already, people get along for the most part. You have your differences, but you get along. They make it look like that people are fighting everywhere, and it's the blacks and it's the whites and it's the Hispanics and whatever. It isn't that. It's it's these guys that are controlling things. And the sooner you realize that the authoritarians are the problem, a hundred percent. It's not it's not each other mm -hmm. in our way. It's them getting in the way of freedom. That's what the whole thing is. There was this uh, meme that had this jar of red ants and black ants. I don't know if you've seen it, <clears throat> but it's got a it's got a jar of red ants, a hundred red ants, hundred black ants. A guy puts them in the jar, he shakes it, he puts it on the ground, and they start fighting and killing each other. And it says it's the guy who put in the jar there that did the problem. Mm. You leave the ants to be and they're not going to ever get into the fight. It's the guy who puts them together, forces them together, shakes the jar. And that's what's causing your problem right there. It's not the natural between these two that are fighting at all. But that's, that's what a, the media constantly. That's a great analogy. And, and, and that's the media. That's what they're constantly doing. Mm. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Uh, without them to agitate, it's the same with wars, without yeah. a, an elite to mobilize and propagandize and fund these wars, how would the populations ever come to such a conclusion as to invade or or have to do any such thing? You know, we're, just, we're busy doing our own thing, living our lives. Like, war only happens because elites on high propagandize and mobilize and fund these things and make them happen. Uh, otherwise, the only things that would happen would be petty, small border disputes right. or tiny. It, it, they'd be over as soon as they began. These kind of things. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and another thing about how you were censored, which is how I could tell who is a flat earther and who isn't. The ones who the ones who are like you know who they are are the ones that are really, you know, they don't have integrity. They're 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 just there because they're shills. And then the ones who they they hide as much as they can, and you and you fit that latter description. They they hide your stuff because they they don't want people to look at it. That's what that's about. And I remember I used to be a uh, I worked on Ron Paul's campaign. Well, I helped work on Ron Paul's campaign for president. I don't know if you remember the Ron Paul revolution thing. Okay, well I was big into that because Ron Paul is like 
he's he's like you as far as authoritarian. He's not an anarchist, but he's somewhere further than a libertarian. A technique. He's he's for basically three laws: contracts, property rights, and don't hurt somebody else. That's basically where he's at too. You know, minimal courts and stuff like that. But I remember Ron Paul's campaign, Eric, and he had a balloon. It, it was it was the, they call it the Ron Paul Revolution because there was meetups like all across every state every weekend. We'd go somewhere and we'd meet up and we'd talk about the Ron Paul thing. And um, there was a he had a um, during one of the straw poll things. He he had a, a, a blip. They didn't even show it on the news. They talk about these other Huckabee said this and whatever the other candidates puppets were. And they never hardly talk about Ron Paul. And then during the early straw polls, there was one of them was getting 22 percent, 20 percent. Ron Paul was getting 19 percent. And there was a 17 for They didn't even put Ron Paul's name on it. They just show the 22 guy, the 20 guy, the 18 guy, the 14. And they don't even show him on there. They're trying to get you to just ignore him, get him out of your mind as much as they possibly can. They don't want you to think. And that's exactly what they do with you, as I noticed with the flat earth. It isn't like your stuff should be top shelf. Every every flat earther should acknowledge, at least acknowledge, if nothing else, Eric Dubay brought this back into circulation uh, circa 2014. And this is the guy who's on top of things. And, and another thing, you don't pull punches anywhere else either. A lot of these guys, they stop there. It's the flat earth. They won't talk about like the the Bilderbergs and all those other the Illuminati and who's controlling them and Zionism, they won't talk about that at all, no. at, right? And they're afraid of them, and and a big part of that is. And I wanted to get your thoughts on the assassinations, the Kennedy, Lincoln, and King, and Kennedy, uh, Bobby Kennedy. Is that all? You, would you technically agree that those are Rash Eilt trying to? Um, we don't know, but the preponderance of evidence suggests that. Meaning that that they were offed because of their policies and whatnot. Yeah. As well as um, some other, I think, was it McKinley? And there, there's Garfield. Who, there was pretty much every president that has been assassinated or had an assassination attempt on them uh, tried to end the Federal Reserve or... Um, the precursor to the Federal Reserve. Um, so th there, there, there is very suspicious uh, reasons behind these these supposed assassinations. There's other people that wonder if some of them are propaganda and that they weren't really assassinated. I'm, I'm open to that, but yeah, that's, yeah, so, it's people like that too. Yeah, right. People that um, say. Uh, it, it's really difficult to get to the bottom of those things. So I, I have I kind of leave it a little bit open. But I tend to think that they were politi true political assassinations because it makes sense. They were doing things that were counter to what was wanted by people like the Rothschilds at the time. So it makes sense that, that they would be. And it doesn't make all that much sense, honestly, that you would fake it. Like, why why fake assassinate these people? And, and that would mean that these people are now suddenly going along with the plan or they were all along with. Then why... You know, what what purpose did that serve? And I guess you could say the same with Trump, um, because it's I'm on the fence with that one as well, because and I also think there's shades of gray, too, where it's not like you're either the best hero possible that America needs right now or you're the worst ever. You know, Trump, oh, yeah. Trump to me seems like he's 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 clearly done a lot more on the positive side than so many presidents in you know maybe since jfk maybe um and the, the media and everyone else seems to be coming after him in those same ways for those same reasons now there's other things like his support of israel and going back on certain promises and his support of the vaccine and support of the space force and and these kind of things that make me question like how genuine can this guy really be if he knows as much as i know then there's no way he could be doing what he's doing and saying what he's saying and backing these policies but i am open to shades of gray you know he's 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 in the thick of it he knows more than i know about how the elite actually run because he's one of them and been rubbing elbows yeah. with them his entire adult life so 
he may be making compromises, uh, strategic compromises that I can't, um, you know, know about or whatever. And so I'm at least happy that he's done, and like you said, about uh, making people distrust the mainstream media. He certainly has had a uh, wonderful yeah. effect there. And so even if he's only made, or um, um, pedophilia and the, the whole Hollywood, yeah. that whole yeah. thing, that's all come to light under his umbrella. And so those are all positive things that happened and probably would not have had the chance to happen had he not um, been president and, and made a, a big fuss about them as he did. So definitely um, there's positives there. I, I just, um, you know, like the video you were talking about, I more overarchingly philosophically disagree with the whole system. Therefore, yeah. anybody that is risen to the very top of this parasitic system and <laughs> you know, it's, it's like uh, you're guilty by default, no matter how good you you do. Um, and in the sense that you are, you are a part of a parasitic system, you are taking um, money and all that. But if you and, and it's difficult, how can you dismantle a system completely in four years from just kind of a right. cerem ceremonial <laughs> figurehead right. position? Um, you can only do so much. So, um, yeah, I mean, I can be grateful for that without being 100 percent aboard the Trump train. And I'm not 100 percent right. uh, off of any other you know, for, for example, JFK or something, it seems to me like he was a similar shade of gray where he's coming from one of these bloodline elite families and he's rubbing elbows with all of these psychopaths. But he himself doesn't seem to fit the bill so much. He seems more like a rebel and someone that was using his position of power to do what he could to do what was right. And obviously having to make some sacrifices and compromises along the way um that make people like me suspicious of like how genuine are you but then i think of like well if i was in that position how you know and then people look at me and then i'm trying to make all these decisions and compromises and and literally you know who knows if if he was to expose this thing and not that thing there might have been a gun to his head and he knew it and so you know it's there's quite a a game to play if you're at that level of the world stage and you're truly trying to help things you can't maybe you can't necessarily just go out and be like hey guys i just became the president Woo. okay the earth's flat i just got all these yeah, declassified okay. documents uh, you know nuclear weapons aren't real dinosaurs never existed and and then you and you get free mainstream media you know you can be in the oval office and doing this and just having a, like a live stream it's like okay. anyone want to comment what, is, what do you guys want to talk about like there's obviously um rules set in place and people that are not allowing that kind of transparency like, that's what i'd like to do if, if i you know, i wouldn't want to become president because of the whole reasons i said i don't want to be the top leader of a parasitic system but if i did how would you dismantle it we'll bring extreme 100 percent transparency to it to that point it's like all right i'm gonna live stream my whole presidency on kick let's go uh, here yeah. we go eric dubay presidency uh <laughs> That'd be freaking awesome. <laughs> but but this is the kind why don't we have that? If these are our public servants, why aren't there like uh cameras on them twenty four seven so that we can see these lobbyists making backdoor deals with them and, and what they're saying all the time if they truly are our representatives? Right. Why don't we see them all the time? Every single thing that they're doing. Why isn't there complete transparency in this internet age? Uh, I don't see anything but excuses as for why that can't be. Yeah, yeah, and uh, um, but like you said, Eric, it's a parasitic system. You get you get to the top of a parasitic system, it's because you're a parasite of, mm -hmm. of the to some of, degree. You've compromised yeah. yourself to some degree. Yeah, and but he go he Trump went rogue, and the only um, at least by their standards. Um, but back in, do you remember Jimmy Carter's era? He was kind of like a peace, like, I'm not a huge Carter fan, but he, he, the guy was a man of peace. He wanted to bring peace. And I think that's why he got kicked out too, because he was trying to actually get some peace going in there in the Middle East. And they don't, Israel doesn't want peace. They want world domination. They don't want a guy, he basically stood in their way <clears throat> and they pushed him right out. And then along came Ronald Reagan, like a cowboy riding a horse, like John Wayne with all his 
he was an actor for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. And he said he was going to give, uh, uh, close the border. And then he gave all the amnesty to the illegals and didn't close the border. It, but the guy was just a blowhard actor. And, and a lot of, to this day, people think he was some kind of godsend. And, they, and the guy was absolutely useless as was Bush and the other Bush and Clinton and Obama, I, those are all disaster presidents. But at least Trump had somewhat of a backbone mm -hmm. and was somewhat rogue. But like I said, to me, uh, Trump's biggest contribution was the fact that he got people privy to this fake media, that the boob tube is nothing but 90% lie. And they could probably lie 100% if they could get away with it. If they could get away with it, Eric, they would tell you it's going to be 25 degrees tomorrow, so you'd buy a coat. And and it would really be 70, but they, they can't lie. They can only lie so much, but almost all of it is lies. And they pick and choose. Another thing I want to talk about the media, they pick and choose what's quote unquote news. It's always has something to do with something in the government that's going to give you permission to do something. We'll vote this way or support this guy. So you'll be allowed to walk down the street at nine o'clock at night or whatever. That's what their news is always flashing. And then if they want to put you in a state of fear, it's Corona, it's nukes, it's Putin or something like that to put you in a state of fear um, or shame or guilt. And they and they keep you in that low frequency mindset. Now, if television was on the up and up and they were really concerned about uh, current events, they would be talking 24-7. They would be talking about this ped international pedophilia ring and they would be talking about it constantly on every news outlet right across every television set if you see somebody in specific uh suspicious activity reported to this there was 20 people found over here there was 40 people that have a big toll of until it's gone and mm. eradicated completely they would be talking about that problem 24 hours a day seven days a week they completely sweep it under the carpet you might get a news bite every eight weeks or something, oh, we caught 14 people, you know, like that really even put a dent in it, mm -hmm. just to make it look like the FBI or the police are actually out to do this, getting any right. kind of orders to eradicate the international tri child trafficking industry, and it's sickening, but that's what they're about. But the fact that they don't ever mention that, hardly. Right. Exactly, and, it, and now the hoops that uh, Sound of Freedom recently had yeah. to go through yeah. to be able to get their movie yeah. out yeah. after fi five years of going through deals, distribution. Deal. So this movie had been ready to be out there for years and not gotten the chance because the people on high in the movie industry uh, weren't giving it the same credit that they would any other movie that's under their wings. And so they had to basically indie release the thing from some you know, small distributor, and then they're only getting in a very few theaters for a very short <laughs> period of time. And then, uh, and, and even with all these, <laughs> you know, problems, they ended up making like the number one box office. Yeah. So this, this, <laughs> so this, which, which should be a message to these yeah. people trying to quell them. If, if the bottom dollar really is right. what you're all about, and it's not about hiding something, well, then why, why aren't you going with what the bottom dollar is? Because if you actually gave true distribution to this and other, um, you know, pieces that expose these things that people obviously want to see exposed to the point that they are, you know, traveling out to indie theaters like I did to go see it and, and support it, uh, then, you know, you know, maybe you should do that. Or maybe us as the consumers should notice that, hey, these people that act like they're the whole reason for their existence and the reason, you know, things come out the way they do is because that's what makes them the most money. Maybe part of that is a myth. Maybe money is only part of, you know, why these big corporations do what they do. Because on top of money is just power, control and the ability to, to shape the populace. And that seems to, when you're a psychopath, that's way more important than an, another zero in your bank account. When you get to the, the level of super elite, you have so much money that just getting a little bit more money is no longer the fun thing. The fun thing is this, the duper's delight. The, yeah. the actual bliss that you get 
over knowing yeah. how much smarter you are than everybody else and how much you are able to control them at any whim. You just say this, spend a little money here, do that, and thousands, millions of people fall in lockstep with what you do. I mean, people like Rothschilds, for sure, they, they can do, they have that level of ability. They can just snap their fingers at a party like, oh, you want to see this famous person do that? You want to see a million people in that far off country behave oh, this yeah. way? Yeah. Th they, they have control yeah. to that level. And that's more important than another zero in your bank account. And that's why something like Sound of Freedom faces the uh, you know, hurdles, the obstacles that it has to get to number one like it did. Um, if money was, was truly uh, what it was, then we would see Sound of Freedom 2, 3, uh, 4, Sound of Freedom X, Sound yeah. of, you know, we, we'd have just as many as we have Fast and Furious, but um, no, and we'd actually have documentaries, we'd actually be going in there, it wouldn't just be Jim Caviezel, we'd, we'd have actual Marines in there, because that's what people want to see. I, I would like to see actual rings being busted up for real. I would love to see that, absolutely, yes, absolutely. And like I said, if the media should be playing in it, helping to solve this, and they, if they, if they could, if I control the media, you better believe this thing would be over. Because I would be every single one of my workers would be. You put this on every day and run a running total. Let us know and do it twenty four seven. If you see something, you report it. And just like they did with the coronavirus. So if you see your neighbor, whatever. But that's something. That's it. This really exists. Mm -hmm. And um, that should be brought to an end, you know, and the fact that but the fact that the media completely ignores it tells you something about the media. And, 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 another, and Eric, the same thing, I dare say, with the Pope, the Pope knows this is going on. That's why I say there's no doubt he's in cahoots with them, because he should be uh, more than anybody um, in a hierarchical religious, if it was like that. He should be spouting this off from the mountaintops. Look, we got to end child trafficking. Every day he should be saying this, saying mm -hmm. a prayer for it, going places where it exists and trying to eradicate it. That should be his, his function, one of his main uh, uh, duties, I would think. And um, the fact that he doesn't even care or ever talk about it. And, uh, you know, but like I said, that just tells you where the where the media, where our media today is at and how powerful it is, too. But um, but like I said, I, I've known about the power of the media for like since the 1990s and, and the, the way they get us into wars and all that stuff. And, um, and it's a tiny percentage of control of things. And back to what you said about the money, too, Eric, they, a lot of reasons they don't worry about money is because they can print it any time they want it and they've done it you know you guarantee that what is it the debt ceiling's 32 trillion now so you could run the gdp for a year and you wouldn't even cover the debt so now they're they're printing money it's so ridiculous they're printing money to pay the interest on the debt that they owe that just makes it more debt and but like i said when you're in that system that, that's what it is and then you a, a parasite system like you said too when you really get down to what money is, money is labor. That's really all money is. So that's, there's $32 trillion worth of parasites going on from the government right now. And almost more than half of them are bureaucracies. And and, and let me get, I, I explained this for a long time too about the banks. Okay, Eric, if, if you go to the, you want a house, for example, 99.9% .9 of people don't have $200,000. So they go go for a loan. So they go to a bank to get a loan. Well, there's fractional lending, which is 10% now. So they only have to have 10% of what they're loaning. So long story short, you you go to the bank, you say, I want $200,000. They give you $20,000 and the $180,000 they didn't give you. So they gave you $20,000, okay? You go buy your house. Now, 10 years from now, you default on your loan. You default on it. And I'll say you paid them back $100,000. Okay, what you paid them back is a true dollar because you worked for it. So, but because you defaulted on your loan, they take your house. Okay, so now in 10 years, you gave them $100,000. They gave you $20,000. They take your house and they didn't give you nothing but 10% in the first place. So they gave you $20,000 in 10 years. You They got back $100,000 and a house. 
on top of it and gave you, like I said, they gave you virtually nothing because they only have to have that 10% reserve, which is even debatable if they have that. And that, and and then they say, well, look at the bank house. The banks got screwed because they only sold the house at 50. No, they made a hundred percent profit because everything you gave them after $20,000 is pure profit. They didn't mm -hmm. give you nothing. Right. And people don't understand that, but that's the way the banks operate. They they don't, they're parasites, they're complete parasites. Absolutely. And then you've got the federal government that runs like that. And like I said, on parasite, they, and all the bureaucracies that are anti-constitutional. Um, I believe our founders said that every, so every generation, the government has to be trimmed like, because it grows like weeds. If it doesn't get trimmed, it'll just grow and grow and grow. Well, that's what we're seeing now, too, right. with all these wasteful bureaucracies. I could just name right off the top of my head. Uh, let's see, the Department of Education, complete sham. Mm -hmm. NASA, complete sham. Um, uh, the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, all of these uh, spy agencies that are spying on us more than they are anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Military industrial complex, which is over in every country that it doesn't belong in in the world, instead of minding our own business, you could slash that by seventy five percent and wouldn't even notice. In fact, probably ninety percent wouldn't even notice, because bombs are built for one of two reasons: to kill people and to serve as a, um, a deterrent. So if you have enough of a deterrent, you don't need it. That's it. You get you know unless you're planning on killing people, and especially people in other parts of the world minding their own business. But you could you could slash that federal budget. I guarantee you, I could sit down. Even though I don't have a, you know, I'm not as knowledgeable anywhere near as a congressman. But I could go through their books and guarantee you, I could slash that federal budget within a month. I could come up with a budget that would slash that federal budget by ninety percent, and you wouldn't even you the you the average person would not even notice that. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, two percent back in 1850 is all, all that was spent on government. Mm. At, at all levels and it's like you said it should be, if you just attached an opt-out clause to it that would end any disputes we wouldn't have to fight over we're going to pass the school levy or whatever you want to pay for your public education to, to, for somebody to show nasa cartoons to them during the day then go ahead and do it you want to listen to the history that's a bunch of bs go ahead and send them to do it you want to hear science you want to science go ahead and you know dinosaurs or whatever you want to sit there in a classroom with a ball that spins with water on it go ahead have at it mm. you yeah, know when you discuss these things with people you find that people like us that are freedom oriented we tend to assume that everyone else would would want freedom but then you find that not everyone actually thinks freedom is such a good thing and we talk about them about anarchy yeah. voluntarism then they start coming up with these things where they agree that controlling other people and having power over the whole populace is a good thing and it's necessary and we need this eric and yeah. you find out that not everyone agrees that freedom is an ideal that should be striven for many people don't agree with that and they they have other ideals in their mind that they would like to force upon the entire population yeah instead right I and, get it. and some people are lazy some people actually, Eric, they want to be told what to do. They want that boob tube to tell them, well, let me see, what, what should I take with my breakfast? You know what I mean? Or go to a wiki search and look on look on something that, you know, instead of figuring it out yourself and using your own common sense, they, they want to be told what to do, what to think, what I should eat, what I should go, how much work I should do, and, and the whole nine yards. And, and, and they, it, they have no faith in their fellow man because you say, well, if everything was voluntary, then we'd still get things done. Well, who, you know, who'd make the roads? What about yeah. schooling and all this stuff? And it's like, well, you don't think that the people would build the roads? You don't think that it would it would happen anyway? And a lot of them, they'll come up with certain government program. Well, but what about this? But what about that? And they feel like if they weren't stealing money from everyone to pay for these right. certain programs that they benefit from or they think that, that they like they're not willing to allow everyone the freedom to be able to decide whether or not they want to fund these things and they actually agree with using statist power to take money from everyone to fund these certain things and so that's what we're up against not everyone actually agrees with freedom yeah, not everyone fun. actually wants to be totally yeah. free a lot of people have things in their mind that they want society to be like, 
and a lot of them are happening right now, like the welfare state, for example. And if you say, you know, you want to end that because you want total freedom, they're like, well, I'm benefiting from that. And like you said, a lot of people are lazy and they're like, well, what, I know that would mean I'd have to work or right. you know. <laughs> I have to pick up a book and read instead of her in a video on YouTube. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's just, that is a fact. People are lazy. That's a plague these days. And with the welfare thing, too, they, like you see that a lot of these people on welfare, they're really big and they're heavy and they're unhealthy. And they eat all this garbage food and they sit around all day because they don't work and they get real big and they're terribly unhealthy. I mean, that, that is just physically, mentally, spiritually, they're just so unhealthy. And that's what the welfare system has done. Well, fair. I mean, so see, again, it's doing the exact opposite. If you look at these people, are these people yeah. faring well? <laughs> no. no. <And> <laughs> so, these are the people, the worst faring people in our society are the welfare people. So again, they, they use these terms and you end up getting 180 degrees from what they're supposed to be. And if you philosophically think about it for a while, it makes no sense that these things should even be in existence. Um, again, have faith in humanity, have faith in your brother and families and neighbors, and you don't think they're going to be taken care of? At least to to a basic degree. I mean, if if we weren't being parasited off to the to this nth degree that we are, for sure, families, friends, neighbors, and the lazy and or handicapped or whatever else the reason is that you would have to be on welfare person um, should have other avenues to be taken care of. And you know, if they really are um, true victims or or someone that people are going to feel bad for. People are going, that's what charities are for. We set these voluntary donations up for, yeah, for people, yeah. you know, for pitiful, uh, for people that we feel sorry for. And yeah. and if you let it be volun voluntary, then it's actually beautiful versus if you steal from everybody and then you say, here you go, we, you know, we wanted to help you, but no, we didn't want, <laughs> or, you know, maybe, maybe somebody that you stole from, now they need help. And there's no system in place to help the person you just stole from because they don't have a named handicap or they they don't they're not able to get welfare because of some stipulation or what have you. And so which is redistributing forced redistribution of wealth like this is not the answer. Freedom no. again is the answer. But uh, we have a lot of obstacles, including people that don't want freedom uh, to go up against. Yeah, there's not all that much you need to sit in a classroom or open a textbook to learn. That type of learning is not really relevant for most fields of study. Most things, if you're going to learn them, they are experience based. That's why all throughout history before the public education system came into effect, it was based on internships and tutelage and uh, apprenticeships. So you go and you work for the thing that you want to do for a living. You actually do the thing. That's that's where the education happens. Well, if I always got <laughs> if, Imagine if, if you were you wanted to be a blacksmith in medieval times and they're like, okay, but you don't get to, you know, you don't get to, to light your first fire or um, hold your first hammer or, or anything until you've gone through 12 years of irrelevant math yeah. and, and language right. learning and, and geography. And geography. And, yeah, right. <laughs> On a globe. Algebra. Yeah. <laughs> All these random subjects that they force feed into people that have no relevance for the rest of their life. Meanwhile, like actual life skills, like the things they, they teach in home economics, like those are being phased out. The, the things that, that are the most interesting things that you could do in a school, I would say, are like physical education, music, oh, yeah. art, and home edu uh, home economics and those kind of things. Those are the first programs to be cut out, and those are the first programs to be like, they, they act like those are peripheral and those are the least important things. Meanwhile, uh, doing a new math subject for every single year uh, is, is, you have to do in social studies, these kind of things you have every single year and all they're teaching you is a bunch of propaganda or one side of a, a certain story. So yeah, I would agree that 90% of public education could and should be cut. Uh, well, actually 100% because 
um, yeah. this the public education is not how this should be done, especially if you're right. uh, forced taxing the population to fund it. No, we can do homeschooling. No. People can yep. fund their own tutors and do apprentices and all that stuff like we had before. And if you want to do private schools, there we go. We got freedom again. So now you can have the freedom to set up whatever kind of private schools you want and the parents can choose to send them there or not, or they can homeschool free. No state curriculum necessary. Thank you. You know that. Why does the state need to have their hands on our children's minds in that way? Anyway, we're, we're so again faith in your neighbors. People are scared that if we allow for homeschoolers to teach whatever they want. Well, what about those those literalist Christian flatter thing, whatever? And then, and then they don't want to allow them to, there to be a certain type of person. You know, they want everyone to think that they're monkey men spinning on a big bang ball. And if they if, don't, oh, how dare we allow the freedom for there to be other religions or other philosophies or atheists or agnostics or whatever. You know, everyone has to, to fit in the same bill, the same mold. And that's what all public education really does is codifies one set of supposed truths, mm -hmm. gives them to our youth and then grades them based on how, how well they regurgitate them back yeah. and yeah. like yeah. that's that's not education yeah. that, that's, that's just... mad. It's, the more brainwashed you are the better the right. higher the degree and the higher the gpa exactly, exactly. so the most indoctrinated get a, doc, a doctorate <laughs> you're indoctorate and I feel bad. I got an MBA and I was you know I had a 3.9 straight through every year but it's like you know what? I know 90%. I won't say 90%. I'll say half of it was just garbage that you just tell, okay, this, this, check, check, check. But I mean, I, I value my degree to a certain extent, but I understand too, it takes in doctor, it's a lot of it's indoctrination. But yeah, I will say that. Well, a lot of things it's not I a complete learn. waste. I mean, I, I you know, I learned a lot in my philosophy classes and my literature classes and stuff. There's, there's certain things that are great, but. Uh, the the whole system as a whole certainly needs restructuring. I could have gotten a much better thing, shorter, cheaper, in some private thing if you know if it existed. I'm sure. <clears throat> yeah, me too. And uh, the, the research class, I remember taking the research. I really liked it because the instructor she would say, "You do the essay, okay?" She said, "This is how I'm going to grade you. You just like the flat Earth, okay? You you would say." Okay, this is what I'm going to talk about. That's your introduction. Then you get, go make your three or four points, and then you give counterpoints. So this is why I say the Earth is flat. This is why they say it isn't flat. This is my one, two, and three arguments. These are the counters. This is my conclusion. If you know you do that logically, you get the good grade. They don't care what your perspective is. That's the kind of teaching they should do because yeah. that's what's teaching you to, to learn at a high level. Um, high, true higher education is when you can study, you step out of your bubble and look at the other guy's perspective, the other person's perspective, and then you see what, then you compare the two and you draw your logical conclusion by logic. Mm -hmm. And with the flat earth, it's a no contest. It really isn't. And like I said, but people are, are not taught that way at all. They're taught you think this or you're an idiot. And, and, um, and yeah. Like, they love to teach us what to do rather than uh, how. I'm thinking of in martial arts as well. There's a lot of like a poor martial arts instructor is going to slavishly teach you techniques and try to perfect the uh, same with yoga too. And they're constantly, perf per per you know, adjust your hips a little bit this and a little, oh, and it's all about technique rather than concepts, which te generally the, the better uh, martial arts and the better teachers are going to teach concepts uh, and then let you deal with the minutia and the technical aspects yourself because everyone's different and what might work for a five foot three woman as a yogi or martial artist is going to be totally different for a six foot two man and you know or wait there's a whole bunch of different factors to take into consideration and if you're slavishly looking at the minutia of technique or in the education field would be information ra rather than information acquisition and research and critical thinking. And in the other fields, it would be concepts and like mechanics and dynamics of how to throw a punch, how to throw a kick, 
um, and, and you know, using your body weight appropriately and speed and these kind of things. Or uh, apparently you did judo. So, for instance, in judo, uh, rather, throws. rather, yeah. I mean, obviously you have to know which throws, the techniques. You have to learn the techniques so that you can apply them. But then the main thing that you actually learn throughout your the course the course of your judo training is the application of those techniques how they can how you can actually apply them in various situations and that is so dynamic that it can only be taught through experience you have to actually be in there be yeah, feeling right. it and then feel the slight you know pulls to the left pulls to the right push this way so that you know exactly how you need to respond whether a shoulder throw or a hip toss or you know or evading in certain ways is appropriate in the moment you can't just think like oh i'm gonna do a shoulder throw now come on i wanted to do a shoulder throw now <laughs> you, everything is so dynamic and in the education world it's the same way we should be being taught how to think not what to think and so your example with the essays if if we're just being taught the structure of an essay and how to do a critical essay and everything, and we get to choose the what we're talking about, and we're not graded whatsoever based on the subject matter, because any subject is as good as any other subject. We're just grading concepts here, not technique. Um, then, yeah, I would agree that, that that's how education could and should be, but then it wouldn't be propaganda and indoctrination as they want it to be, so we, we can't have that. We have to have standardized tests and uh, have them regurgitate information that we throw at them rather than set it up in a way that structures people towards learning and they, uh, that's another thing they took out was the um the trivium like the um uh, logical fallacies and uh, oh, yeah. fallacies, right? these kind of things uh a formal logic like why why wait as an elective in university for such a incredibly useful subject like logic like everybody thinks that they're logical, but like whenever you talk to yeah, somebody they, and they're, they're yeah. displaying their ideas, they're like, do you follow my logic? Isn't this perfectly logical? And then it's like, have you ever taken formal logic? If you have, you don't have to ask me. You can actually write, there's equations to find out whether the thing you're saying is logical or not. And then there's like 50 formal fallacies that people commit all the time without realizing it um, that aren't logical. They're just persuasive or they seem they're seemingly logical, but they don't actually follow the conclusions from the premises. And, but they don't teach that. I mean, and, and it, you know, I went through years of formal logic uh, and, and it's really enjoyable. And I still feel like I could take many more years of it and learn much more it, versus like I said, algebra or some of these, and it's very similar to algebra. That's the other thing. Formal logic is when you look at it written out, if P and then the arrows and G and the, Oh, what is this? It looks like algebra, but everything stands for statements. So everything is is in language and it's standing for logical statements rather than just numbers. But it's the same the same idea, just like one plus one equals two. If yeah. then statements work that way, if so and so, so and so is, therefore, do do do. And and that's how it's um philosophy works in that way with if then um three-part equations like that and there's there's plenty of fallacies along the way where it's like uh, if a then b um a therefore b that's a modus ponens logical um argument but then a real simple fallacy would be if a then b not b therefore not a a lot of people think that that's logical but that does not follow from those premises just because the conclusion that you thought would happen didn't happen doesn't mean that the premise didn't happen. And so there's a whole bunch of these logical fallacies that you can find out um, and, and hear all the time people using. But if you've never had a framework for them, nobody's ever taught them to you, then you just fall into it. And you find a lot of the stuff that they are teaching you in school as truthful information are logical fallacies so no they wonder are. no wonder yeah. they had to take it out <laughs> no wonder they had to take the trivium out of the bullshit that they teach in modern yeah. school because we'd be like uh but you just taught me yesterday that <laughs> yeah the van wagon fallacy that's a that's a good one that's <laughs> that and the, and the appeal to authority though that's the one that's got us the worst 
But I also do, wonder, wonder what your uh, take on, okay, I do an inventory. I try to do an inventory every day, at least a couple times a week, because it's human nature to do that, to fall into some of these traps with your ego or whatever. So you're going to, you want to, I want to make sure when I'm telling somebody something, I'm not doing what I just told somebody else they shouldn't do, you know, using some kind of bogus fallacy. So I just like try to leave them open. You know, I try to say, you do your own research. Here's the information I'll give you from Eric Dubay that you're not going to read anywhere else. So just go ahead and read it at your own leisure. Come back to me and let me know what you think. And then we can debate it or discuss it if you want. <clears throat> but don't use the fallacies that you're, you know, you're taught or you're not going to come up with a, 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 an accurate solution. <clears throat> what, what's your take on that? Would you say do an inventory or, you know, um, periodically would help? An inventory of what are you like saying? Yourself, your own behavior. Okay, so so okay, so example, Eric. I I would say okay. I tell somebody the earth is flat or whatever, and then the next person says, well, if you wouldn't have said it so condescendingly, which I probably did, <laughs> and then I start thinking, okay, next time I say this, I'm not going to sound kind of this child like I'm with the person. I'm not trying to degrade you. I'm just trying to tell you what you were taught was similar to what you were taught with Santa Claus. Mm. Step back just a bit with your ego, throw it aside, and then think that. But if you don't, if you do a periodic inventory, you won't you won't behave ho how you're judging others' behaviors. Mm -hmm. And that's what I I do try to do that every day, at least every other day. And and um, and and also when I, when I'm discussing flat Earth, I, I and I know I've posted this on one of your videos underneath one of your videos. But when I talk to people about the flat earth and I start and they, and if I catch their, I do pique their interest enough to having just a normal discussion or somewhat of a normal discussion. And I'll, and I'll say something along the lines of, well, you, th I mean, this is what I will say to them. Well, you think the earth is spinning 1,037 miles an hour and it's going 66,000 miles around the sun. In the meantime, you can see the uh, North star in the same place every day. And they, they always come back with, I never said the Earth is going 1,030. I never said it's spinning 60. And I say, well, isn't it amazing that I know more about what you believe than you know about what you believe? And that is because you, my friend, are brainwashed. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't know more about what you believe than you do unless somebody brainwashed it into your head. Your subconscious is just regurgitating what somebody else already told you. You don't even know what you believe. I know what you believe, so you're your brain. I'm trying to get that out of you, know, like defrag a computer and then reset it with the truth. That's all I'm trying to do. Absolutely, but the like, if you say those exact words to your friend or your family member or your neighbor, the social repercussion of the interaction suddenly becomes way more important than the truth or falsehood involved. Is what I'm finding. It's you. They just don't want you to be wrong. And now they yeah. don't want to have to talk about flat earth every single time they see you or to every time that they make eye contact with you to have this thing now be between you that, that well, we don't agree. You, I, I kind of think you're a crazy person now and I don't know how to deal with you normally anymore. And I think that the main, <laughs> the main issue we're dealing with is stigma, social stigma and egos. Yeah. It has a lot more to do with that than it does to do with actual conveyance of information. <laughs> if you can actually sit somebody down and they're like they're open and ready, you can you can get them to understand the truth in a simple conversation. The the real problem is getting them to that space. How do you marinate them? How do you prep them to be ready to actually sit down and just with an open mind be like, now tell me a bit more about this flat earth thing that you you're talking about? Because nobody really wants to hear it. That's right. the issue. And so how do we make it so palatable, so so um, intriguing that they really want to sit down and pay attention? I think that's our next mission <clears throat> is to try and make the flat earth message so interesting, intriguing, entertaining that the mainstream sheeple that want nothing to do with it will uh, focus just for the entertainment factor. And I think People like the controlled opposition that moved in on this, uh, Netflix, you know, they made this thing behind the curve, right? And 
all these mainstream people, of course, flocked to watch this one. The people that wouldn't watch 200 Proofs, the people that wouldn't watch the Flat Earth Conspiracy or read a, a book on it, they all watch this Netflix documentary that gives zero information about the Flat Earth and gives an hour and a half personality piece on a couple of the worst examples of, of flat earthers in the yeah, world puke, I know. for millions I know. of mainstream yeah. people to laugh at and to confirm their bias that they already thought ahead of time, which is that flat earthers are crazy people and they give them exactly what they, they wanted and confirm their bias. And now they would never click on another video like 200 proofs. That's not even entertaining. That's not even funny. Like, like the people on the Netflix documentary were. At least they were crazy funny. I clicked on them to laugh at them. 200 proofs, that's just, that's just um, sad. You know, people say that. And they're like, I don't yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, if they even come across it, it's like I said, they, they algorithmize you right out of the equation. Oh, yeah, you'd never come across it now. <laughs> you can type it in and you won't get it. You can type in specific names of my videos and they won't show up. Eric, I remember I convinced both of my brothers, two of my three brothers, and the first, the, the one agreed with me, too. he goes, yeah, you're right, that Eric guy, he ain't no, I was like, well, so I started sending him the stuff, I was like, here, it's like, okay, you know, and then you check it out like that, but your stuff is pushed to site, and then they show these flat earthers with the watch and the thing, and that's for, to me, that's for people who just want to, oh, there's a flat earther over there, click, 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 you know. In the meantime, the, the CIA probably knows every one of these little, where every one of these guys is at, because that's what he's doing. He's giving away free apps. Well, it's only $3, like whatever. They don't give you nothing for free. That's a oldest catch in the book. Okay, nothing's free. So they're giving you these apps because they want to know exactly where you're located at and exactly every move you make. And that's the only reason you're getting a quote flat earth app. It ain't because you even need it for any what, what purpose would you even need it for? Mm -hmm. and, but that's to me, that's that, that's a sign of a CIA agent, a Mossad agent, because that's what they do. Every spy agency will give you will try to locate with every every bit of personal information on you that they possibly can on their dis dissidents. And then, like I said, a lot of these some of the new flat earthers are probably just ditzy. People who just like, oh, I'm a flat earth. You know, they don't even understand the actual value of being a flat earth. What your what your your job is, is to lead other people, you know, to get other people on board with this so we can eventually get this mainstream so we can eventually change uh, the, you know, the whole paradigm of what's going on. And yeah, uh, it's, it's not just some click group. It's not... Uh, Oh, I found my people and now I'm just going to be in my little group. It's like, no, this is a movement of truth we're trying to bring into the mainstream so that we can end a lot of the darkness that we're seeing in the world. As I said, this is like the, when you're trying to fundamentally change a populace and lie to them, you have to start with the world to change their worldview. And so that's what they've done with this whole cosmological lie that we're all under is the flat earth lie is the rug that we need to pull out from the elite. And once we do that, their whole table of cards will fall to the ground. Absolutely. People aren't seeing how much of an Achilles heel this flat earth subject actually oh, is. They think it's too peripheral and too irrelevant, but it's actually by far not peripheral. It's what we stand on. And it's completely relevant because it's the biggest and longest running deception in all of history. And so many of their other deceptions rely on this one to prop it up. And once you know about this one, all their other deceptions, it, they're so easy to see. It's the same reason none of the flat earthers fell for the COVID scam. Yeah. It's the same reason that, you know, know. flat earthers are so easy to wake up to almost every other conspiracy. And usually they already know it. And once you meet them, it's like they're at the bottom of the rabbit hole, so to speak. Um, and that's what we're trying to bring to people. We're not trying to stay here in a little, little clique in the bottom right. of the rabbit hole and be like, Look how cool we are. We made it. We're the ones, we're the in-group. It's like, no, this is not fun. We don't want to be a here. Right. I mean, they'll just stomp on us if we stay here too long. We want to come out from the underground and take over the overground, uh, you know, with this, these nuggets, uh, these gems that we found down here. We got to bring them up to everybody else. That's our mission. 
bring yes. it all back up to the surface, not just stay down here collecting nuggets and being happy about being part of the in-group down the rabbit hole. That I agree with a thousand percent. And I also agree it's by far the most important because um, the other ones you can, you can't really uh, morally justify some of the other conspiracies, but you could, you could, um, you could make a case for why they're going on. Like, okay, so for example, okay, you could say, well, yeah, United States started a war, started World War II, and yet, but the banks did it because of the money, and they did it for political power, and to keep this uh, military-industrial complex going, and to control the world. Yeah, but the you know, and and you you can kind of get people to, on board with that somewhat, or these some of these assassinations that happen, or the television nonsense. <clears throat> But when you say when you tell somebody the earth is flat, especially in my generation, it's like, what are you talking? Where the is you know, it it just it change it's a it's a shatters you, it takes you to a different level. And like I said, back in 1988, like I said, Eric, 1990s, when I started understanding the media, the banks, the government, the way it works, history's nonsense and all that, I said back then nothing would surprise me. Nothing would nothing would shock me. I said, there's things that would surprise me. Nothing would shock me. This was somewhere in between when I found mm -hmm. out the flat Earth. It was like, what? I, and, but the minute you start researching it in an honest, unbiased way, yeah, it's everything about it makes sense. <clears throat> I felt the same way when, I mean, I had the inkling ever since growing up that I don't feel like I'm moving. I don't see any curving. Standing upside down on a spinning ball doesn't make any sense to me. But nobody's talking about it. Literally, nobody. You're the crazy person if you even mention yeah. your common sense perspective yeah. and li lived experience. It's like, you know, nobody actually feels or observes any of this stuff they're telling us is 100% true. You do get that, right? It's like, yeah, but this picture is on TV and they went to the moon and all the adults agree. So it is what it is. But then you, you find these old book or I find these old books and that just changed changed everything for me and you find these intellectuals from 150 years ago that were butting heads with this ex exact same mentality and going head to head with the members of the Royal Astronomical Society of their day and they had debates and everything and the flat earth people these crazy flat earth people their books make way more sense than anything you're hearing from your teachers and your textbooks and Neil deGrasse Tyson and all this heliocentric stuff from NASA. Actual experiments, actual measurements, actual observations and empirical data and the way that it's being laid out, it's just so matter of fact. And you're like, huh, there's nothing crazy about, the only crazy thing is the fact that all this data exists and it's like buried these are all out of print books. Nobody talks about them. Nobody reads them. And they act like this information is non-existent. But it's just buried and waiting and prime and ready for everybody to delve into it. But everyone is so brainwashed, indoctrinated, ego-driven, lazy, you name it, that they just don't want to do this and figure it out. And you don't have to do that. You can buy a, a P900. You know, you can do this, you can zoom in, you can do that. You can uh, get, get a high altitude balloon and attach that to a camera. You can get yourself a level or a theodolite and check the water over distances. There's actual experiments you can do to find out that there's a worldwide conspiracy that everyone is brainwashed into. And you can figure it out in an afternoon, if you cared. <laughs> that, that's like I'm saying, our big issue now is getting people to actually care enough to do this slight modicum of experimentation or research it's like not even that much just read this one book flat earth faq or yeah. take yeah. this p900 go to the shoreline or what it could be that simple but it has to come from them when we try to force it onto yeah. somebody else never happens and so the big the big mission is how do you inspire you have to inspire you can't push it onto them through right because you want them to know i want you to be interested in this thing that i'm interested in yeah happens all the time i mean i have so many random interests uh, it would be cool if if everyone around me had all the same random interests that i do mm -hmm. you know uh, martial arts and yoga and all this stuff. but most people you tell them about it like, eh, i don't i don't want to do yoga 
been trying to get my dad to do yoga with me for 20 years. He hasn't done it once, you know. What? But what he knows the earth is flat and he's turned vegan and, <laughs> and uh, he's, he's as big a conspiracy theorist as I am now. So I'm not complaining about it, but I, I'm giving uh, the point that not everyone is going to be interested in the thing that you want them to be, even if it's so important like this, even if it's like the biggest lie in human history and it should yeah. fundamentally be important and interesting to you just because of that. Eh, no, it's not for some people. And you got to find no. some other way to package it that's going to make it uh, palatable for them yeah. or not. Or the other, you know, that's one option. That's what I'm saying we need to focus on if you're trying to wake people up. It's like now we're at the stage that all the inquisitive people have been, and skeptical people, they've woken up. All that's left are the people that um, don't really care one way or the other. So they need to be entertained or intrigued to some high degree to even care enough. So we either need to affect them that way or forget about them completely and focus on those of us that are awake and things that we can do to further this whole movement. And, you know, they'll come along when it's time because that's what they're like anyway. They're not leaders. They're not, the no, they're not people that are on the forefront of societal changes. No, they're the people that when the tipping point comes, they go, they look around and they go, oh, did everybody tip to the other side now? Oh, okay. I'm a flat earther now. So we don't really have to work so hard at, at um, individually bringing them along because that's not how they operate anyway. These people are in groupthink. All we have to do is shift the groupthink. Um, so I don't know how to do that. I'm, I'm not necessarily giving practical answers because, again, I'm talking about concepts, not techniques. <laughs> uh, that's the way we teach is we teach through um, through how, not what. You know, this is how we need to do it. But what? Well, up to you. Everybody's individuals and, and has different strengths and weaknesses. So what might right. work for me is not what's going to work for other other people because of their different lifestyles and, and uh, advantages and disadvantages. So um, with the martial arts now, you, you I know you're a black belt in uh, which one is that? I have a second degree black belt in Taekwondo, um, oh, but my, my main focus is in Wing Chun, but they don't have belts. But I've also studied a bunch of other martial arts. Like, now, what's, your, what's your take on boxing? Oh, I love boxing. Yep. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, Wing, Wing Chun is is uh, Chinese boxing, just like okay. Muay, Muay Thai. They call Thai boxing. They just add basically they add kicks and knees and elbows. But um, the boxing fundamentals that are there in in Western boxing are the, more or less should be there in in both. Yeah. yeah, I remember doing that one summer, and and like you said, Eric, there's uh, you know, I could tr you know, there's shadow box, and you skip rope, you hit the bags, and everything's beautiful, and it puts you in just such great physical condition, and then you go in there, and actually get hit. It's a different animal, like you said, nothing like that. Cont that's what's going to get you better or not better is in the ring, actually getting exactly. punches. Yeah. Exactly, it's all theory up until that point. Yeah. All technique based. Oh, you threw a perfect punch. Yeah, now try to do it on somebody that's moving around and punching you. Good luck. And I coach you all the yellow at me. Quit posing. And, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then I see stars, and I, I didn't get knocked out or anything. But I, I just like, wait a minute, this is not glamorous. Right. It's like, okay, I don't want to get hit. That ain't my purpose here. Like I'm with you. Self defense. If you could get out of it, get out of it. And do you remember they had they used to first have those UFC con competitions, the ultimate fighting thing. There was a guy named Royce Gracie, and he could he could beat anybody with as long as he had that gi on. But it's situational. If he's got a gi on and you don't, you're done. If he <laughs> don't have a gi on, he's not so tough. I mean, he's still a bad bad dude, but he's not going to be as as tough. So it's all a lot of it is martial arts will be situational. And then is it, you know, is there two guys? Is there three guys? Does somebody have a weapon? All of these variables play into it. But I, I'm with you 100% too. The idea of martial arts is defense. If you can get out of it, that's the purpose of it. Get right. out of one piece. You're not really looking to get hurt or hurt anybody. Yeah. And when you're training, I would recommend having that as your mindset because a lot of people, when they teach MMA, for example, which is one of the best things you can learn, I would say, is is the tr current mixed martial arts um, 
you know, that's what they're teaching now. It's like the new style is MMA. And there's so many benefits to it because it does mix some of the best martial arts together for ring fighting, uh, for rules based fighting. And there's stuff that you need to know on top of that to make your mixed martial arts truly mixed. Because what nowadays is is passing for MMA, because like before there was MMA, there was something called Jeet Kune Do, which is what Bruce Lee came up with. But yeah. it was the exact same philosophy as what is now turned into mixed martial arts. But because it's been named just like Jeet Kune Do was named, just like the 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 Dao um, that he was basing it off of, the the oh, Dao the Dao of Jeet Kune Do, he didn't want to name his fighting style for the same reason the Taoists didn't want to name the Tao. And so the first the first uh, line in the Tao is that the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. In other words, we're going to name this thing to try and talk about it as a concept. But now that we've named it, we've made it into something that it isn't. And you need to understand that. Otherwise, you're going to believe in this conceptualization rather than the meaning and intention behind it. And that's what Bruce worried about. And it's exactly what has happened, <laughs> even though he tried to prevent it, is once he named his style, well, now it's a style. It's no longer this philosophy that was, his philosophy was research all available information. Absorb what is useful. Reject what is useless. Add what is uniquely your own. And I've done this for martial arts, and I've done this for pretty much every other thing in life. It's taken this exact advice, and that's how I've come to these great conclusions about flat earth and dinosaurs and nuclear weapons and everything, is because I actually took Bruce Lee's advice, and I've done this. I research all the available evidence first. I don't just research one side or two sides. If there's three sides, I'm going to research that as well. Then I'm going to absorb what's useful from everything around me. I'm also going to reject what is useless to me. I'm not going to waste my time on it or regurgitate it just because it was there in the stuff that I researched. And then fourth, I'm my own person. I'm part of this whole process. I'm going to add what's uniquely my own to it. And in martial arts, you absolutely have to do that because you're not the same as the five foot two, right? You know, fat woman. Say, well, I'm right. a six foot two uh, skinny man. Things they're going to work totally different for me, and I have different uh, advantages from my history of like I have second degree black belt in Taekwondo, so I'm really good at kicking. You might be terrible at kicking, and so a whole different base philosophy of how to conduct yourself in these situations will work better for you than it does for me. But once we start to codify systems like judo, jujitsu, jeet kune do, even MMA. Tradition, nowadays, MMA, what that means is Muay Thai, Western boxing, wrestling, and uh, what's the fourth one? Um, Jiu-Jitsu. Jiu yeah. Um, that's what they call MMA. It's stuff like Kali or Aikido or Wing Chun or, you know, you name it. Anything else outside of that, which should be, that's also mixing your martial arts. That's outside of what any MMA gym that you go into would teach because what now is MMA is that just like if you go to uh, someone that claims to teach Jeet Kune Do rather than doing what Bruce suggested and actually modifying the system to the point that it wouldn't really be recognizable um, or nameable what what do they do they just they take that book and they, they try to do every technique the way that Bruce did it and, and teach it exactly that and suddenly it's now this rigid narrow system that was the exact impetus for Bruce trying to get to not have it be <laughs> the, he hated yeah. the, that everyone was systematizing everything everyone, uh, and then Bruce. oh I'm the I'm a karate guy I'm a taekwondo guy I'm the, he's like learn everything Bruce make it work for you and stop being so obsessed with the labeling and the lineages and naming everything and just work on you the martial artist because you're the end product the end result that's unnameable beyond any label and whatever style ends up being inside you it's not really going to be Wing Chun. You know, my Wing Chun, it's unrecognizable as Wing Chun. And I wouldn't want it to look like Wing Chun because all the guys that look like 
Wing Chun out there, they get their asses kicked because they haven't actually sparred and, and pressure tested these techniques that they're learning. Once you do, you find out, oh, I got to open up and I got to integrate all these other things, including Western boxing, to, to make it work. And, and that, then you become a true martial artist beyond name. Jeet Kune Do, MMA, even these labels are, you know, too yeah. narrow. Yeah. Bruce Lee was not that tall, right? No. He was like 5'7 or somewhere. Yep. I think he was 5'6, yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I remember when I first seen him, Eric. I was a little kid, and I don't know if you remember the Kato. He was yep. on, okay, Batman and Robin, and he kicked Robin and just, you could just see that this guy. I don't know who he is, but I didn't even know who he was at the time. But this guy was just fluid. I mean, he knew, like you said, individual. He was, whatever he was doing was just like, it reminded me like of Nadia Comaneci at the 76 Olympic. Everything was moving. Just even if you're not a fan, you're like, wow, look at that. And he was just like poetry in motion. And I remember he he just like tore Robin to shreds. But he, he it was like unfair too. It was like a, a wolf against the sheep. I mean, it was just ridiculous. But you could see he knew whatever he was trained at doing. He was right within his element. And it, it was just unbelievable. Yeah, absolutely. People think he was just an actor and like a martial artist actor or whatever. But he, he was a martial artist first and became an actor afterwards. But martial arts was always his main focus. And it was, you know, like the the way he modeled his life around was uh, the discipline of a martial artist and, and trying to strive for constant perfection through his martial arts and then taking that into every, you know, every facet of life. Because um, it's like, Kung Fu means hard work in Chinese. And so your Kung Fu isn't just <laughs> punches and kicks and everything. That's, again, it's that's the technique part. The concept is behind that. The concept is throw a thousand punches, throw a thousand kicks. Then when the time comes and you actually need it, it's in your muscle memory and it just happens. And that that's kind of the same thing with how you develop yourself as a human in, in every aspect is you integrated in yourself so fully by being it by, by doing it consistently that when the time comes to really act you will flow naturally and be that person that you need to be in the situation um, because of that training uh, it's a bit esoteric but but once you start doing it you can feel how applicable these things are to your everyday life because you're you're you know you're trying to maximize uh, every little thing you're thinking about uh your effect on another person you're thinking about the psych fight psychology and and all these things they they really do snowball into other aspects of your life that you wouldn't ever have thought of until you actually get into it and then you're fascinated by the the things that you learn about other people or about uh, other situations that have nothing to do with martial arts I, I, there's a quote, I think Joe Rogan said it, he's like, um, you know, I, I could learn a lot more about someone sparring with them for 10 minutes than I could having a, a three-hour conversation with them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he was relating oh. it to his um, his podcasting, and when he's actually able to step inside a ring with someone, he learned different things about a person that you could not learn in the situation of just sitting there at a table having a friendly conversation um, on a podcast put them in a situation where they have to physically defend themselves or else they're going to get punched in the face over and over again. Um, and then a different side of them comes out, not just physically, but psychologically and emotionally. And then you're, you've are you now pressure tested this person in a, in a way that you couldn't possibly do in any kind of conversation. And you might see sides of them come out in little glimpses and gestures and expressions and things they say um, that show their character in ways that you wouldn't have been able to examine their character uh, in any normal, situ normal situation. So these kind of activities, um, like martial arts, have incredible benefit that are, it's so esoteric and difficult to talk about because it's different for every person too. It's like things that may have benefited me in my life uh, and there's a parallel that makes sense to me why training in martial arts helped my public speaking Absolutely. or something. But for you, uh, training in martial arts might not help you be a better public speaker at all, and you'd have no idea how those two things could, you know, <laughs> coincide. 
<laughs> right, public speaking is something that like you it, it takes a skill. But I found out a long time ago, it's so much easier to do when you don't when you're not rehearsed. Like you got to sit there. You you watch people try to public speak. The ones who are the most nervous. Here's how they look. Eric, they're trying to read word by word. <laughs> no, and that I, I used to tell. I told a hundred people that that ain't how you public speak. You talk. It's yeah. like you talk on me and you. That's how you public speak. When you try, when you think you have to memorize every little, you don't. Throw that thing out. Just take a few bullet points and discuss like you do. And if you have the truth on your side, public speaking really isn't that hard to do at all. Okay. And I like to use humor too. I know I've heard some of your stuff. And I and, and before I get get a little uh, digress here a minute for a minute, but I listen to some of your <laughs> rap music that you have, and I am not a fan of rap at all. But some of that stuff you got it. I can listen to that on my way to work and laugh half the time just because it's so entertaining. Like it's so humorous. You think nobody would ever even say that. And it's like. <laughs> That stuff it's just freaking great. It's like it's like so stupid. It's I won't I'm not saying stupid is meaning less than probably, but it's like it's so outside of the beltway, so to speak. It's funny. It's like wow, did you really <laughs> say that? But but I definitely find humor is huge because people pick up on that. They really do it changes your frequency. Everyone likes that opiate dose of humor, whatever you want to call it. And I do try to use that, but some, like I said, some of that rap music stuff that you came up with is just—it's funny, and it's like it makes so much sense. Now, what did, when you talked about Duper's delight, that's just a concept, <clears throat> a psychological concept. Is that is that a, is there a plague of that, or you think that just comes from the psychopaths up top? Oh, I, there's also secondary psychopaths, which is what happens when you live in a society run by psychopaths, or if you <laughs> live in a household uh, in a household headed by one. What often happens is, even though you internally feel empathy and remorse and regret and shame and things that psychopaths have no conception of and never feel a day in their lives, because you've been indoctrinated and around them so much, you take on characteristics and behaviors of them and in a way that your influence on other people often becomes like a secondary psychopath and so that your influence in the world becomes somewhat psychopathic because of the experiences you've had with them growing up um, okay. so absolutely psychopathic tendencies can be um, pushed on to other people even accidentally um, what, what was your original question though the duper's delight. It, it's oh, duper. like get their jollies, you know, just because they can get one over on you. And it ain't about any any other thing other than that psychological rush, perverted rush they get from screwing you out of something. Exactly. And, yeah, and and definitely the psychopath. You could see that with them. It's like that's that. Was of course, thing. they'll have it because they don't have empathy or remorse anyway. But then that can be inculcated into other people as well. And I found, I think, one of the best ways to do it is secret societies. That's what the secret society does to a normal person, is it turns them into a secondary psychopath. Because the second you step into a Freemasonic lodge, you have to now swear these blood oaths that you will never divulge the secrets of masonry outside of the lodge. And so you become two-faced. From that moment onward, you have now sworn a solemn oath that you will only tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth to these few people, to these Masons, to these brothers of yours in this special windowless building. Everyone outside of there now, your family, your neighbors, your friends, and everyone in society at large is now on a lesser scale. You're, you now have a two-tiered reality where you can only be fully honest with this one group of people and everyone else you have to deceive them, at least to some degree. Now, once that is your fundamental reality, it's a slippery slope and you start to become more and more rooted in that mindset of a psychopath and starting to enjoy, like they do, the power and influence and knowledge that you have over them because of this secret knowledge that you have. And that is the duper's delight that gets inculcated into you is that suddenly now part of your good feeling part of what makes you happy what, what um, energizes you 
is watching other people be duped. So this is another thing we're faced with. Like I was saying, not everyone wants freedom. Not everyone wants truth, too. There's a whole sector of the yeah. population that loves lies. They love it. It is I, fun I, for them to lie. They get a delight off of you believing the lie. It's not actually the lie that's fun for them. It's when you believe it. And that's why you have the phenomenon of a troll. A troll is not as bad as a psychopath, but a troll is like a secondary psychopath in the, the sense that their entertainment, their fun, comes in this duper's delight. Okay, and then I want to get your opinion too on, um, I know I've heard you uh, address this, but the organized religion. The, the, to me, the, the, the more... The more man is is controlling a religion, the worse the religion. Hmm. So that's why I don't like the textbooks and the lecturing. And, and uh, although I agree with Christian principles and most of what's in the Bible, I don't follow them because they're hierarchical, they're government controlled, they're media controlled. And and like you said, with a lot of the stuff on your site with the, you know, did Jesus exist? Do you believe the Bible metaphorically? Or literally, and it had to be something produced by a man, or it wouldn't be in words on a book somewhere. But the more, the more it's controlled by man, the, the less I follow it. I'll leave it at that. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if it's supposed to be from God. If the whole point is metaphysical, why are you looking at the physical? If the whole point is it's from God, why are you looking at what man says about it? It's religion should be something so deeply personal that you couldn't possibly have a universal textbook or a named labeled religion that encapsulates it i think everyone should ponder the divine and the afterlife and these kind of things for their entire life and never really come to a conclusion because how could you possibly know hasn't everything been set up in such a mysterious way that us, the subjective perception units here on this earth, have we don't have an objective perspective to make um, definitive, conclusive statements about metaphysical things like the afterlife or God or what or what have you. So, rather than foregoing, you know, go, go getting to a foregone conclusion based on on uh, not enough evidence, we should all have the modesty to not cling to some labeled religion or a single man written book and say that this is the whole truth and nothing but the truth and then try to force it on everybody else right. i don't agree with with that at all whether you you know whatever you call it whether it's christian buddhist taoist or any other label um again freedom for me trumps it all and freedom is outside of all those labels Truth as well, honestly, right? Truth couldn't be encapsulated by those labels. For me, the, the my four pillars of what, what, like what I strive to embody are, are um, freedom, truth, peace. And then the fourth one, which encapsulates them all, is love. Mm -hmm. And so if, if love is your driver, you know, the opposite of freedom is slavery. The opposite of truth is lies. The opposite of peace is violence. And we've got a lot of those negatives in the world. The opposite of love could be hate or fear, depending on your definition. But the way to combat all of them really is love. Because if you're doing the loving thing, then you're not enslaving someone else. If you're doing the loving thing, then you're not lying to someone else. And if you're doing the loving thing, you're not causing harm, violence on anyone else. So really, when you're doing thinking or speaking, is it coming from love? Mm -hmm. Really, all you really need to do is, as a precursor to your own introspection, when you're, when you're thinking what to say next to this person or what to do, does it come from love? If it does, then you're probably, your, your compass is oriented correctly. If it comes from anything else, you probably should think about it before you take action. <clears throat> I can I agree with that totally. And with the flat earth, honestly, I researched this for after looking at your book for a good year or two before I just, hey, I'm a flat earther, no question about it. 
because I it's so deep and so powerful that you want to make sure you know for a fact that this mm. is correct before you go and put yourself out there. But yeah, it's that's um it's it's the truth. And and um and and you know we gotta and like I said, we have to spread that as you know, make other people leaders as much as we can. Because that's the definition of a leader is getting other people to learn how to lead themselves. Right. It's not uh it's not beneficial or um, you know, have, having followers is, is what's got us into the, this mess, right? We don't want to be following anything, really. If we could all, like uh, with the political system, the whole representative idea, that's being a follower. Like we're, we're voting for someone else and then we just hope that they do everything that we want them to do. It's not really a position to be in. Um, no, it's we, Right, we want to be the leaders ourselves, even if we can't be um, up in the UN or whatever they're doing. There's there's political things that you can do in your own life, and eventually, maybe you would be be in a certain position that you wouldn't be now. But looking at it as if like the main thing that we should do uh, is vote for just some random person once every four years, and that's the only political action the right. average citizen should take or needs to take for there to be significant positive change in the world. It's like, oh, what a utopia. So easy. <laughs> like, well, unfortunately, the the we just deal with whatever they decide to do, right? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we don't have enlightened leadership to the degree that we can all just sit back and be happy followers and everything's going to work out fine. That's exactly no. what's gotten us into this mess. And if anything's going to get us out of it, it's like you said, we all have to become our own leaders in, in a certain way and take the responsibility and accountability for what we can do and do do in our own lives. That's, that's again, it's way too easy to point the finger and project the problems of society onto some political figurehead or, or yeah. part of some system in society and be like, this is why, this is the issue. Yeah. But they're all systemic like iterations of, you know, where does all this come from? Where does society originate? You know, obviously these are all manifestations of what's inside all of us, which is what I'm trying to see in myself and expose to other people. It's like, rather than pointing at all these elites and these systems and the politicians and all this stuff, that's all outside of your control. It's like, yeah, it's great to recognize that those things are in existence and they are um, obstacles that we face, but how do you get to the to the level where you can actually face these obstacles? Are you, you know, what are you going to do about the Rothschilds? What are you going to do about the fact that NASA's stealing all this money from us all the time? It's like that. The answers to those questions are really the only important answers because anything outside of that, well, what have you done then? It's irrelevant. Good job. You sat and you watched a documentary. Good job. You read, you read right. yet another yeah. book. Right. Now what? It's it's not actually going to change anything unless you make it change anything. And the first thing we can change is ourselves. And again, very esoteric. Okay. I hear that all the time. Change your, You want to change the world? Change yourself. Okay. What? What do I change about myself? Well, again, very esoteric. Everything. It's not just one aspect of your life that needs to change. It's every little thing. Your, your absolute psychology, your, the way you communicate with other people, the words you choose, what you buy, where do you spend your money? Are you spending your money and it's benefiting these corporations and the government? Right. Right are you spending your money at farmers markets and to people with their own businesses? And are you intentionally doing that? If not, then there goes your power. You're just, you're just spending wherever it's convenient. You're just spending your money wherever it's cheapest. Okay, well then that's your ideal. Your ideal is to be cheap. Your ideal is to be convenient. If your ideal is to save the world, try and help the world, well, you got to think about your purchases a little bit deeper than that. Where am I going to spend my money? Where am I not going to spend my money? You know, health is important. As everybody knows, if you're not healthy, you're not right. active, you're not in enjoying your life. You know, it comes before anything. If you're not healthy, you're just sitting in bed doing nothing. Maybe you're taking resources. Now you're other people that could be helping the world now have to help you so that you because because you're sick. So, I mean, 
So what can you do? Well, look after your health every single day. Find a way to look after your health, raise your vibration, raise your energy. And then if you j just that aspect suddenly makes you a beacon of of um, health knowledge, for example, or it makes you it makes you have an aura that you wouldn't. For example, you know, if I'm a vegan, non drinking, non smoking yogi versus an alcoholic uh smoking fat you know right. lazy guy somewhere uh who do you th and, and then and then both of us were in the same room together at a party and we both decide that we're going to try and convey the flat earth message now flat earth has nothing to do with the fact that i do yoga or i'm vegan or or i try to have good posture or and uh, you know good health and all these kind of peripheral factors they have nothing to do with the flat earth but what do you bet I'm going to wake more people up to the flat earth than the fat slob over there exactly. who's smoking cigarettes and half drunk um, <laughs> when he's <laughs> and meanwhile if, and so if you can develop yourself so that you you're the kind of person that people look up to because you have integrity and diligence and you know other character building traits that you've acquired suddenly your words have meaning uh, you know people pay more attention um there's so many peripheral factors that we're not considering that actually are contributing to the fact of why our message isn't being spread or why the truth isn't getting out there faster or why freedom isn't ringing true to everybody uh you know, I don't have all the answers, but I, I am saying that I agree with this esoteric philosophy that says that the way to change the world is to change yourself because I, you, you are in the world and everything you do, every action, every word you speak really has snowball effects, be they positive or negative or somewhere in between based on where you're at. And so we all want to push ourselves towards that that end of of just being the you know the what would you call that the um in maslow's hierarchy of needs self-actualization is what oh, he calls yeah. it. the oh, peak right. you know we don't want to be at the bottom where we're still worrying about survival and what we're going to eat tomorrow i mean oh, some people have to and that's unfortunate that we live in a world that that is still the case but for those of us who have the privilege and the ability to work all the way up maslow's uh hierarchy, hierarchy of needs of need to the point that we can self-actualize, which is basically what I'm talking about, is we all need to self-actualize to the point that we're all our own leaders and leading humanity in a self-actualized direction, which would be freedom, truth, peace, and love, and not lies, slavery, violence, and hate, um, which is what, unfortunately, we see all around us, and can we can only manifest the opposite through ourselves we can't like, point fingers and be like be more loving <laughs>